let's have a quick review before we get into the meat of dynamics. So these are things you should have learned so far. The solution process, some math conventions, order of operations, definitions, units. Units are really important. I'm going to stress that in this class. But also conversions between various units. You'll have to use geometry, trigonometry, and vectors in this class. Algebra and matrices you should have learned. And there's a bunch of other stuff as well besides all of this. Obviously, um, how to use experimental data and analyze it. How to use uh, tabular data analysis, uh, iteration tables, and representing things graphically. Now, what you really need for this class is number one, the solution process, GFSAC. And there's some things that, yeah, you probably do need a little bit of geometry, but this class doesn't focus extensively on geometry. However, you will need trigonometry and, and vectors. We won't use matrices, but you will have to use algebra. And you can see that there are several things here that you won't need. There actually is a little bit of, of graphical solution to consider in this, this class, but we'll approach that as we come to it. So let's look at each one of these. Uh, another thing you'll need is derivatives and integrals of some polynomials and trig functions. I'll show you what you need a little bit later. So let's consider each one of these. GFSAC. So we're given two different equations. You could probably represent this in matrice form. You know, take the inverse of the matrix and solve it. And uh, that would be fine, but we won't need that level of, of solution. But here's what we're given. GFSAC, let's use it. So here's what we're given. What are we supposed to find? Well, the unknowns are X and Y. The solution, we could use substitution. Of course, there are other ways to do it, but in our case, we will use substitution. Or we could eliminate by addition. Now, here are the answers. Of course, we'd have to show the solution process. I haven't shown it because of lack of space on the slide, but the solution would be to rearrange one of the equations to solve for one of the variables in terms of the other, plug that into the, the other equation, and then solve for the single unknown variable. That would be a substitution type of solution. On the other hand, if you notice, we've got 2x minus y. If we simply multiply the lower equation by 2 and add the two equations together, we will eliminate y directly. In any case, however you do it, if you do it right, you'll get x and y, and there they are. There's the answer. But the c on the end is also important. If there's a way, you should always check your answers. How could we check? Well, we have two equations there, and we think we have an x and a y that fit those equations. In other words, that make those equations true. So just back substitute and check and see if they, in fact, do make it true. Now, we came up with uh, 10 on the first one, but 3.001 on the second. Why? Well, because we rounded off, right? We rounded off a little bit. It, you know, 16 over 7 is about 2.286. It's not exactly 2.286. Of course, we could plug in the fractions themselves, and then we should get the exact answer. But, you know, just remember that when you're checking, sometimes your numbers may be off just a little bit, but it's probably okay if you've rounded off somewhere else in the problem. Nonlinear solutions to, or nonlinear equation solutions, uh, we will end up with some nonlinear equations that need to be solved. The most common one will be a quadratic equation. So something like uh, something that has an x squared and an x and a, a non-variable term, a constant term. Of course, the solution to this is simple. It's the quadratic formula. And you probably have this memorized. If not, commit it to memory now because we're going to use it quite a bit. And what you notice about this is that you can't figure out what a, b, and c are until you get the quadratic equation in two the uh, standard form. So notice that the left-hand side version of the equation is not in standard form. We can see that a is equal to 3, but it's not obvious that b is equal to negative 7 because we've got 7x minus 1 on the right-hand side of the equation. If we move everything over to the proper side of the equation, get it in so-called standard form as it is on the right-hand side, then we can see a is 3, we can see that b is negative 7, and c is equal to positive 1. Plugging that into the quadratic formula, we actually come up with two different solutions because there's a, a plus or minus there. Simplifying down a little bit, there are two solutions, two different numbers that will solve these equations. In other words, if I plug in 2.1806 for x in the equation or 0.1529, I will come out with an equation where the left-hand and right-hand sides are equal to each other. Now, let me warn you that in these problems, Quadratic formulas are not the only types, or are 
second order polynomials, I should say, are not the only type of nonlinear problem that we may approach. We may end up with equations where we have to use goal seek in Excel, which is another way of solving these types of problems. Now you may or may not have used goal seek to solve problems at this point. Throughout the class I'll show you maybe once or twice how to do that. And I think you'll really like it because it's an easy way to solve nonlinear equations. Now of course we can plug in the numbers and check to see that the equation does match left and right hand side. We can plug in either one and we get you know, something that works. Degrees versus radians. A lot of students seem to struggle with this. What is a radian? Well, a radian is the arc, well, it's the angle made when the arc length is equal to the radius of the circle. And in that case, that angle is about 57.29. It's irrational. It goes on forever. Uh, degrees. But that is defined as an angle of one radian. Now, if you think about this a little deeper, you can figure out that radians are, in fact, dimensionless because of this uh, fact that the arc length is equal to the radius. How many radians make up a whole circle? Well, it's 2 pi. And if you think about it, when we multiply 2 pi by r, we get the circle circumference. We get this, the perimeter length, right? So you don't have to multiply by 2 pi radians. 2 pi radians make up a whole circle. What if you were just interested in you know the the distance of this this arc well if we multiply apply one radian by the radius r we will get an arc length of just r so in other words there are two pi or about 6.28 radians per circle now if we add up all of these uh, arc lengths you'll see let's see so far we got one two three four five six there's six and then you can see there's about 0.2832 uh, arc length uh, of you know that, that remains. Now 2 pi radians is the same thing as 360 degrees so if you want to go back and forth between radians and degrees the conversion factor is pretty simple you probably know it there's 180 degrees per pi radians but be careful about that it's not like there's 180 degrees per radian that's not the way it works it's 180 degrees per pi radians and hopefully that makes sense because there's two pi radians, so there's you know one half and then the other half uh, of the uh, the circle. How about sine, cosine, and tangent? Well, I'm going to borrow a figure from fluid statics in another class. Sine, cosine, and tangent. Students struggle with this all the time, but they're actually pretty simple. Uh, if you think about what they are, they're really just uh, relating angles to triangles. That's all it's really doing. So here we've got a line that is measured L sub C. I've highlighted it in red there. Let's, yeah, that is L sub C. And we're interested in the depth of the middle of this, this little door at the, you know, not the bottom, but lower down on this tank because there's going to be pressure acting on it. Of course, since pressure is normal to the surface, well then we need to know this distance so we can figure out you know how much force is going to take to uh, or well how much force is going to be applied to the door and therefore how much resistance we'll have to apply to the door to keep it from just being blown off so we, we don't want that angled length we want the depth to the center of the door and if we know that length L sub C how is that related to the height H sub C or the, the depth within the door well you might notice we have a right triangle here where we know the angle theta of one of the sides of the triangle so there in green is the angle that we know, and if we extract the triangle and the dimensions that we are interested in, hc and lc, how does theta and some trigonometric function relate to those two sides? Well, I remember it in a kind of odd way. What I remember is that the hypotenuse is separate. We're going to have a hypotenuse if we're in sine or cosine. And so if I have a hypotenuse, I know it's sine or cosine. Tangent's the only one that has the, you know, the, the, the shorter two sides of the triangle. So since I've got the hypotenuse, I know I'm in sine or cosine, but how do I figure out which one? Well, I remember it this way. The angle looks like it's kind of shining on or looking at the side. It's not touching it. So that's the opposite side. And when it's the opposite side, opposite over uh, hypotenuse, well, what is that? Well, there's the hypotenuse, there's the opposite. Hopefully you remember by now. The adjacent side is the one touching the angle. So 
sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Okay. Now, the way I remember this, you probably are used to making a, an xy coordinate system and putting your angle in the first quadrant with the triangle, you know, the hypotenuse coming off in that first quadrant. And then you remember that x goes with cosine and y goes with sine, but that's not always the case. It matters which side the angle is touching. That's the way I think of it also. So in a regular you know, XY coordinate system with the hypotenuse in the first quadrant, X touches the angle theta, right? And so that's the cosine side. That's the, the so-called adjacent side. That's what we have next is adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine. But you don't always have the triangle in the first uh, quadrant. It can be in other quadrants. And, and of course, you know, it could be at any angle on the paper uh, and so it can be confusing to figure out what you're dealing with. So the, the way I remember it is that if the side that I'm interested in is being shined on, if you were looked at by the angle, well then that's the sine side and then the side that's touching the angle is the cosine side and that always works. Now obviously if I'm not dealing with a hypotenuse and I've got opposite and adjacent, well then I'm dealing with tangent or cotangent. Now I don't really like dealing with arc sine you know, or arc tan or any of those. I prefer to deal with sine, cosine, and tangent and take the inverse if necessary. The way I remember it is that sine and cosine always have the hypotenuse in the denominator and tangent is always the, uh, the, the opposite over the adjacent. So I think of it as the y side or the, the side that's being shined on, okay, over the one that's touching the angle. Now, if you really want to deal with uh, cosecant, then it's hypotenuse over opposite, uh, secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, and cotangent is adjacent over opposite. You notice I had to read that directly from the slide because I don't have those memorized. I don't really like them. I don't see any need for them in what we do, so I don't bother using them. I just included them here in the slide for the sake of completeness. Now, in our case, HC over LC would relate to the angle by the sine function, or the sine would relate the angle to that ratio. So I would know that uh, if I want to calculate HC, all I need to do is take sine of the angle and multiply it by the hypotenuse, which is L sub C, and that would give me the depth in the fluid to the center of that door and would allow me to continue with the fluids problem. Obviously, that's not this class, but the triangle hopefully illustrates uh, sine, cosine, and tangent. Now, order of operations is really important. I can't believe that students come into the class and they still struggle with this a little bit, but it does happen. So remember PEMDAS, right? Uh, parentheses, exponential. And remember exponentials includes things like logarithms and functions and all those. Uh, but then multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So if you just remember PEMDAS, you can figure out what has to happen first. Now I know that seems kind of strange, right? You're taught this in algebra and then they don't really do it in that order. They show you all these rules so that you can kind of bend these rules and you don't have to actually calculate what's inside the parentheses. You might uh, distribute something throughout it first, right? So it looks like you're multiplying. Well, just remember that what we're trying to do here is say math says you got to do this first, but this is equivalent to doing that first, right? So that's something that I always had to to, well, I had to struggle through back way back in algebra and figure out is that really all these rules we were learning was so that we could bend the order of operations most of the time. Here's some equations you'll eventually encounter. These are equations from uh, heat power, which is another course I teach. These have to do with heat exchangers, and you don't really need to worry about them. Uh, the point is there's several variables: NTU, the number of transfer units; C, the ratio of heat capacities; and uh, sort of an E-looking character. Um, that is the uh, effectiveness of a heat exchanger and then the, the uh, E or EXP represents you know E to the power of something, the special number E, the 2.7 whatever that's a button on your calculator. It's important to know what order to plug things in and simplify in order to reduce these equations. You notice that some of these aren't parentheses, they're, they're curly brackets. What are those? Well, those are just parentheses where we've, we've run out of parentheses and we're trying to differentiate, right? So the, the square brackets, the curly brackets, and the parentheses are all really the same sort of thing. It's just we have to calculate, for example, in the second equation, we need to plug in minus C times the number of transfer units to the 0.78 power. What would we do first even in that? Well, we take the number of transfer units into U to the 0.78 power, multiply that by C, and realize we have a negative thing inside of the parentheses. Now, you notice that 
the um, exponential has to be taken next, right? So it's exponential to the power of what's in the parentheses, and then subtract off the 1. After that, then we take the number of transfer units to the power of 0 0.22, divide it by C, and multiply it by the result that's in the square brackets, and then take E to the power of the whole result, which is in the curly brackets, take that from 1, and we would find the effectiveness. The long drawn out procedure, but you can see that the order of operations has to be followed here. So what about this problem? Well, we do the same thing here, right? We, You realize that the uh, division, I mean, it doesn't seem fair, right? Because the order of operations of division happens before addition and subtraction. And so you might look at this and say, well, how do I divide 9 plus 20 divided by 3 divided by negative 5? What do I do there? It's understood that there are parentheses around the 9 plus 20 and that that's what actually has to be taken first. Just like in regular language, just like in English, there are things that are just understood. You have to know things from the context, right? And hopefully by now you've been dealing with algebra long enough where that context is not something you have to think about consciously anymore. But for those of you that may still struggle with this, I wanted to make that explicitly clear that the 9 plus 20, it's, it's 29 in the numerator, right? That would be done first, not because we're ignoring PEMDAS, but because it's understood that that has to be done first. It's understood there are parentheses around those. We just don't normally write them. Okay. What about the minus negative 3? What would we do there? Well, the negative 3 is just what it is. So we would, have to, we would have to take the negative of negative 3. That's like multiplying by negative 1. So the negative 3 would essentially become a positive 3 at the end of the equation. What about the 3 divided by negative 5? Well, of course, we'd end up writing in the denominator 3 over negative 5, but we would just invert and multiply. So it would be negative 5 over 3 times 29, right? So what about this other equation where we've got 2 squared? Well, exponentials have to happen before parentheses, right? No, that's not right. Parentheses happen first. So it's understood that in the denominator, there are parentheses around the 2 squared plus 2. Well, everything inside the parentheses in the denominator has to be done. And 2 to the power of 2 is one of the things that have to be done, right? So it can seem confusing because I said it's understood there's parentheses around this. But those parentheses just mean calculate what it's, what's inside of this and replace the whole parentheses and everything with what's inside of that. So obviously the denominator would be 4 plus 2, right, which is 6. Because 2 squared is 4, 4 plus 2 is 6. And then the numerator would be 12, which then divided by 6. Well, let's see, so what would we get? Uh, 12, divided by, uh, 12 divided by 6 would be 2. And 2 minus 2 is 0, so we'd just get 6 in the lower uh, equation. Useful logarithmic properties. L logarithms are something we will deal with a little bit in this class, so it's helpful to remember some of these rules. I'm not going to go through and read them off to you. I've just put them here for your benefit. Uh, so just remember that th the main thing to remember is that the natural log has base E, whereas log, L-O-G, has base 10. And of course you can convert between bases. Uh, there are some multiplication division properties of logarithms, but I've included them here just to jog your memory. All right, here's something that's near and dear to my heart that I hit in about every class I teach, and that is unit conversions and the factor label method. Uh, so if we're interested in a race, and we know there's uh, four laps in 10 minutes, or that's 10 minutes per four laps, what could we do to figure out what this means? Well, if there's one mile per four laps, you'll notice that the laps will cancel nicely. Of course, then we could multiply 60 minutes per hour. And then what happens? Well, the minutes will cancel nicely. And what are we left with? Miles per hour, right? This is how fast the person is running around the track. Now, when you put all these together, it's really important to put all the numbers together and put all the units together, but consider the units first. Because what's the point of plugging all those numbers into your calculator if your units end up with something that is wrong or you don't care about it, it's not useful? So consider the units first. So let's think about it. Let's see, the minutes will cancel, the laps will cancel, we'll be left with miles per hour. So this would be how quickly the person is running. Now, obviously, we could cancel numbers nicely, but the nice thing is that the units cancel nicely as well. 
So this would be 60 over 10 miles per hour, which is 6 miles per hour. So that's how fast the person is uh, running around the track. What about g sub c? What is that? Well, a lot of students get confused about g sub c. They look at g sub c and think, well, this is just one of those um, bad byproducts of the English system and is a reason that we need to get rid of the, the English system and go to metric uh, entirely. I disagree. I think that g sub c is something that should not have the name g sub c because it confuses you with the acceleration of gravity g. Now if you can remember that it's g divided by g sub c or g sub c over g, that's all well and good and things work out. But it's better in my opinion to just say forget g sub c. The fact is that a pound force is a different amount of force than a pound mass foot per second squared. Now, where students get confused in this is that one pound mass will weigh one pound force when it's on Earth, but that doesn't mean that a pound mass equals a pound's force. That's like saying an apple equals a banana. That doesn't make any sense, right? They may both be pieces of fruit, but they are not equal things. A better way to illustrate this is that one pound mass will be one pound mass whether you take it here on top of the earth, down to the bottom of the ocean, or out to the moon, or put it out in space where there's no force acting on it. But when that mass is near the surface of the earth, the earth will attract it with a force of one pound force. Incidentally, it will attract the earth with uh, a force of one pound force as well, but that's not really worth talking about. But that one pound mass will have a gravitational attraction equal to one pound force. That doesn't mean that one pound mass equals one pound force. They are completely different dimensions. They are different units. As a matter of fact, the only way to convert a pound mass to a pound force, well, that's impossible. You can't. What you have to do is realize that a pound mass times the acceleration of gravity tells you how much force Earth will apply on it, but not in units of pound force. So if I take a, uh, let's say I've got a mass of one pound mass, okay, and I multiply it by 32.2 feet per second squared, what do I have? You can say you got one pound force. I disagree. You have 32.2 pound mass foot per second squared, right? Because I said take one pound mass times 32.2 feet per second squared. All you've done there is multiplied mass times acceleration, and then you've calculated the force on that one pound mass is 32.2 pound mass foot per second squared. You might say, I don't like that. You're saying pound mass foot per second squared. You can't just put those together. Yes, you can. Why not? I mean, you can put feet per second squared together, right? That's a, a unit of acceleration that you're probably comfortable with by now. So why can't we just throw pound mass in there and say that a pound mass foot per second squared, which is all one thing, is a measure of force. It's just that one pound mass foot per second squared is not equal to one pound's force. It takes 32.2 pound mass foot per second squared to be equal to one, for, uh, one pound force, and I think that's where students get confused. Now, you might say, okay, well, that's all well and good, but how then is it that one pound mass will weigh one pound force? Well, simple. Look at this conversion factor. It says that if you have one pound mass, multiply that by 32.2 feet per second squared, now I've got 32.2 pound mass foot per second squared, that is equivalent to one pound force. It will weigh, in other words, one pound force. And that shouldn't be so foreign to you because you're probably used to saying there are three feet in a yard, there's 12 inches in a foot. You realize that a foot and 12 inches are the exact same length, it's just that an inch is a finer scale of length than is a foot, right? A foot is just a more crude scale. It's a longer amount of length. In the same way, a pound force is more force than one pound mass foot per second squared. It takes 32.2 pound mass foot per second squared to be equivalent to a force of one pound force. Some prefixes that you need to know. Uh, we probably won't get into the exapeta, tera, or giga in this class, but we will probably get into the mega, and we'll probably go down to milli or so. Okay, so micro, nano, pico, femto, and atto we probably won't use, but there's a, a table of reference for you and things you probably should have memorized by now. What about vectors? Well, who needs them? Why, why bother with vectors? Well, let's, let me try to convince you that vectors are actually useful. I remember studying in college, and that was the first time I had heard of vectors. I, uh, you know, for whatever reason, had missed them in high school. And I remember thinking about it and trying to figure out how does this direction correspond to a number? Uh, 
And I didn't realize that it was just this, I would call it an uneasy marriage, a, a, a conglomeration of two things that are just squished together because it's useful. That's all, right? Direction and magnitude are two different attributes of something that is useful in describing nature, okay? In describing physical phenomena. So the reason we need vectors is because they're useful. Let me illustrate that. Uh, here's a problem for you. Two cars, both are speeding at 100 miles an hour, and they collide. And my question is, will there be any damage and potential loss of life? Now, some of you would probably say, well, yeah, absolutely. They're both going 100 miles an hour. When they collide, that's going to be really bad. And, of course, the reason you're thinking of that is because you're thinking of a head-on collision. And I, I, don't, I would agree in that case, but think about it this way. Really, whether or not there will be damage to the car or the extent of the damage will depend on the relative speed between the two. And relative speed will depend on direction, not just the magnitude of the, you know, the, the uh, uh, speed of the two cars. So if they're playing chicken, yeah, <laughs> there's going to be a problem here, right? Obviously, if they collide into each other, one's going 100 miles an hour, the other one's going 100, well, that's 200 miles an hour difference roughly, right? They may be going at a slide angle, but the, this is not going to be good. On the other hand, what if they're racing? What if they're side by side and they're racing? They're both going 100 miles an hour, and they just barely touch each other. Well, they'll probably drive away from that unscathed unless, you know, something grabs one of the other car's wheels. So direction is very important. The, the 100 miles an hour, the scalar, the magnitude part, doesn't tell the whole story. Direction is required as well. And the whole reason we use vectors, or we define vectors, is the same reason we define numbers. I mean, who needs numbers, right? Why would you need numbers? We well, need numbers because we need to count things, right? Numbers represent things in the real world, and it's useful to be able to count things like money and, you know, how many uh, calories you eat per day, or perhaps... Uh, let's say how many children you have, right? If you're on a daycare, you really care about how many children are on the bus. You need to count them to make sure the number of children that get on the bus after the outing is the same as the number that got off, right? So numbers are extremely useful in our daily life. Well, vectors are the same way. It's just vectors are the realization that numbers by themselves, scalars alone, are not adequate to describe certain things. Vectors are required. There are also things called tensors, which we're not going to use in this class, but they are just other things that are useful that put several different, you could think of them as just combining several different vectors together for now. We won't use tensors, don't worry about that. The point is that vectors are just a tool. It's kind of like saying, well, why do I need a hammer when I've got this wrench? I mean, I can bang on things with a wrench. Yeah, but it won't be as good as the, the hammer, right? On the other hand, a wrench is the appropriate tool for turning things. Uh, the hammer, you might be able to beat the nut off of the bolt, but you probably won't be left with much of a bolt at the end. And so the, you know, the, the wrench does a much better job. So a vector is just a tool. It's just something that's useful. So we need them in this class because they're so very useful in this particular topic. So we need vectors. Another reason we need vectors, well, we need to describe geometry, right? We need to be able to explain how things are laid out, and vectors allow us to draw things. So in CAD, we use vectors all the time because vectors describe how long uh, distances are between points and in what direction. So these are all vector things, right? And of course, movies use vectors like crazy, and video games use vectors. Here's another reason, <laughs> more from when I was, uh, well before I was aware of video games. Uh, there were some video games way back, this is copyright 1979, it was an Atari game, you may recognize it, it's called Asteroids. And it was interesting because these were called vector games, and so the, the drawing on the screen was very different than a regular arcade game, because each of the lines were drawn uh, from one point to the next. Most CRT screens, cathode ray tube screens, at that time used what was called scan lines. So the, the, the electron beam would scan each line of the screen in order. It would go very fast and it would be turned on and off so that it would turn on dots basically. And um, the interesting thing about these Atari games, there are a bunch of them besides asteroids, is that instead of having that raster just scan the whole screen, the raster would be directed to just draw lines. So it would draw, I don't know how the algorithm worked, but it draw, drew all the lines that made up the uh, image. So you can, it's a notable difference in the way that it looks. If you ever get the chance to visit an a, um, arcade uh, that has 
Uh, nowadays it would be a retro arcade, but one that has one of these original games, you can see the difference in the screen. It doesn't look like this. It looks very different. And usually the, the vertices are much brighter than the rest of it because I guess the raster, uh, not the raster, but the electron beam spends more time at vertices apparently than others. And if you use the vector cutters in the lab that we have, uh, or the laser cutties, uh, the quickest way to cut anything is with a vector, making the laser go from point to point. Now you can also change the mode so that it's a raster mode and it, you know, this is useful for engraving images and things onto wood and plastic and so forth, but if you really want to cut through and do it quickly, you want the laser to move from point to point along lines or curves and use vectors to do it. So vectors are extremely useful for analyzing what we have in dynamics, for drawing things, for even video games, and for making things. Now to describe the the, the system that we're the system, well, systems that we're going to deal with, we need coordinate systems. You're probably familiar with the Cartesian coordinate system, and that is the one that we will default to most times, the IJK or XYJ or XYZ uh, coordinate system. Of course, it's not really an IJK coordinate system, it's an XYZ coordinate system. IJ and K are so-called unit vectors. They are just direction. They are magnitude one so that when you multiply by them, what you're really getting is a direction, not a change in magnitude. And so what we can do is we can describe vectors in coordinate systems based on how much of each uh, direction you have. So by saying AXI, what you're really saying is I have AX length in the I direction, and I have AY length in the J direction, and so forth. So this is the way we, that we describe vectors in coordinate systems. Obviously there are also cylindrical coordinate systems and you've probably uh, used these as well. We will use these in this class. In cylindrical coordinate systems you describe based on other vectors. Instead of an X and a Y, what you have is a distance R and an angle phi or theta depending on how the uh, coordinate system is set up. The most common is to use phi. So there is a conversion to get you from cylindrical coordinates to Cartesian coordinates and of course the other way. The amount of distance along the x-axis AX is R times cosine of the angle phi. The amount of length in the Y direction or the J direction is R times sine of phi. And of course in the height direction the K or the Z direction, uh, the two coordinate systems are equivalent to one another. Now to go from Cartesian back to cylindrical, you have to calculate the length R from the lengths AX and AY. Basically you have to calculate, calculate the hypotenuse of a triangle where AX and AY are the two side lengths. And then to get the angle phi, you again investigate AX and AY in their relationship by taking the inverse tangent of the ratio of the two and that gives you the angle phi. So there's a couple different ways to describe uh, vectors, one in cylindrical and one in uh, Cartesian uh, coordinates. So here is a vector that describes the uh, uh, point from O to P in cylindrical coordinates and it is R, the length of the vector, right, in the ER direction, so you see the R length there which is in the, the horizontal plane, plus Z, the distance, in the K direction, in the vertical direction. So that is an equivalent description of the vector that we have on the right hand side assuming that RPO and A are the same vectors. Now one thing to be careful about uh, in this is that the vector ER, the unit vector ER, depends on phi. It is a function of phi. As phi changes, the direction of ER also changes. In the Cartesian coordinate system, if we have just a, if that's our reference frame, then the I, J, and K vectors are not moving. Those unit, ve unit vectors are still. But in the uh, cylindrical coordinate system, one of the the difficulties with the cylindrical coordinate system is that the vector ER and really actually E phi change as a function of uh, phi. And so notice that I didn't talk about E phi yet. Let me pause on that and talk about EZ or in other words K bar. K bar, the, the vertical direction, is the same as EZ, the unit vector in the Z direction. So that's, that's a constant. That doesn't matter. I mean, it, 
I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It doesn't change in the cylindrical coordinate system, just as it doesn't change in the Cartesian coordinate system. But ER and E phi are always normal to each other. They're at a right angle. So ER goes out, and E phi does change as ER changes. But notice that ER always points in the positive direction of phi. So notice it comes off of phi, if you will, in the, the, the increasing phi direction. So both E phi and ER depend on phi. Spherical coordinate systems take this all one step further where everything is an angle basically except for the magnitude of the vector itself and of course here's the conversions to get you from you know the, the spherical coordinate system to AX, AY, AZ, the Cartesian coordinate system and then back the other way. Now I'm not going to go through this one because we really won't use spherical coordinate systems um, I don't think we use it at all in this class. It's, it's useful, it's helpful, but we're not going to use it. If we have to, I'll review it at that point. But if I remember right, we don't use it. So I've included it here just for the sake of completeness. You notice the ER, the vector, the unit vector, depends on now the two angles, phi and theta. Uh, but let's not worry about that right now. What about uh, the cross product? Here's something that always confuses students. What is the cross product? Well, I like to think of the cross product in terms of torque. So I often take uh, wheels off my cars to do various things. I do all my own mechanic work. So replacing brake pads, investigating bearings, making sure they're still in good shape, you know, turning rotors, all those sorts of things. I don't turn the rotors myself. I take them off and take them and have them turned if necessary. But in taking a wheel off of a vehicle, you have to remove the lug nuts, right, or the bu lug bolts, whatever you happen to have. And if you have, you know, if it's difficult to do, one of the things I like to do is extend the, the wrench, right? I like to use a cheater bar. And if you think about that, there's actually a good reason for it because there's actually two different moments applied to the lug nut or the, the head of the lug bolt. Now, I think I've got an animation here. Let me see if it works. No, it does not. Well, anyway, so if you think about pushing down on the handle of the wrench in order to turn the nut and get it to come off, obviously the length of the wrench handle is the moment arm for that force. And that's a good one, right? That's the one you want. Now, if I extend that with a cheater bar, then I've got even more torque to unscrew the nut or the bolt. But there's another moment that I don't want, because even if you look at this uh, picture that I've got here, the wrench stands out from the lug nut or lug bolt off of the wheel by some distance. That distance is also a moment arm that tends to try and, if, if I can represent the, the nut here with my fingers, and this is the socket, it tries to bend the socket off of the head, right? And that causes problems. You don't want that. You just want a pure twisting of the nut, not bending off of the socket coming off of the nut. So if I make a long moment arm, if I use a cheater bar, does that make the, you know, coming off of the nut, does that make that worse? No, it doesn't, because now I can apply a lower force at the back end of the cheater bar and have, because of the longer moment arm, still generate the required torque to remove the nut. But now I haven't really changed the, the length off of the wheel face to the wrench, right, how far the head sticks off because of the length of the socket. I haven't changed that, but I have reduced the force and therefore the, the moment that tends to round off the nut. But all we're doing here is talking about cross products, where, you know, the, the torque is equal to the vector R uh, from, let's see, make sure I get this right, from the uh, uh, nut is essentially to the point of application of the force crossed with the force itself. Now we can represent the distance and the force both as vectors and you can see that I've got a matrix set up here to show you how to do that. The first term where we have the so-called I component uh, of the torque that is calculated based on the J and K components of the uh, position vector R and the force vector F. And I've tried to illustrate this graphically here so you can see how each one of these terms come about. And if You'll get used to this, I hope, when you, you take some cross products. Most of the time we'll try to avoid actually using the cross product, but in case you need it, I included it here in the slides. Uh, but the way I kind of memorize this is that each of the terms i, j, k are plus, minus, plus, and then 
the I term involves J and K pieces of the vectors, the J term involves the I and K pieces of the vectors, and then the K term, the K direction if you will, involves the I and J components of the uh, position vector and the force vector. Integrals and derivatives, you probably all love calculus, right? Well, let me give you some good news and some bad news. The bad news first is that we will use a little bit of calculus. The good news is that this is about all the calculus you need in this class. In fact, you probably don't even need quite this much. If you want to, you can just take this slide and print it out as a page and have it for your reference, okay? Uh, by the way, the last, uh, if you look kind of in between the two bar bars, the black bars, where I have J, J stands for jerk, we probably won't even use jerk, so you could just cross that off immediately. We probably won't use sines and cosine integrals, so you can cross those off. Obviously, I included these because they could be useful, but I try to avoid them just to make your life easier and probably my grading life a little easier as well. Other than that, though, the integrals and derivatives you really, really need are, I tried to put one in the center there, x to the n dx. That one's pretty important. You need that one. Uh, if it's a 1 over x, in other words, where n is equal to negative 1, then the integral of 1 over x dx is the natural logarithm of x. Those are the most important integrals that we need. But the other piece that you need is what's in between the, the two bars. And what I'm showing is how position, velocity, and acceleration relate to each other, where if you di differentiate position with respect to time moving to the right, you get velocity. And if you differentiate velocity with respect to time, you get the second derivative of position, which is acceleration. If you do it again, you get jerk, but we're not really worried about that. On the other hand, the lower arrow that points to the left says, as you integrate jerk, you get acceleration. Of course, integrating with respect to time. If you integrate acceleration over time, you get velocity. And if you integrate velocity over time, you get position. Now, don't worry about all that. I'll explain that in more detail later. I mainly just made this slide for your reference. So you may want to print this out and uh, keep it handy somewhere.